On to the next says this. Hello, my question is, can evil predict the future? Specifically, can someone's death be predicted? My younger children were told by an older family member as a child uh, that used to play with a Ouija board. They were told uh, how old he would be and what uh, would be involved in his death. I'm looking for verses to read with my kids to show what God says and obviously to stay away from that stuff. So on this subject, uh, what's going on here, Pastor Steve, and can evil, their definition, predict the future? Okay. Um, w- when, you're, when you're talking about predicting the future, I can predict the future. In 10 minutes, I'm going to walk over and I'm going to smack Mike Simmelness on the side of the head. Yes. Right? And so what, what I'm doing is I'm telling you what I'm going to do. Uh, and Mike Simmelness is, you know, he's, he's here. He's kind of our producer here. And so I'm telling you what I'm going to do. And so uh, if, if nothing intervenes, then all I'm, uh, all I'm doing is I'm, I'm giving you my intentions. I'm not predicting the future. I'm giving you my intentions. Now, if in 10 minutes um, uh, Matt sees me get up and start moving towards Mike and he feels the need to protect Mike... He can keep me from smacking Mike upside the head. I can try. Yeah, he could try, and he probably could do it. You know, he could he could body block me. There's you know there's all kinds of things that could happen there. He could take out my other knee, and so um, he could he could do that. And that's a great um, illustration of what Satan is doing when he's giving prophecy. He's he's not telling you the future. He's telling you what he intends. And the problem with uh, Satan telling you what he intends is he has the ability to make those things come to pass if God allows it. And if God doesn't allow it, God can send an angel to take care of the guy. He can send Michael the angel and say, Michael, just, you know, just make Satan stop, you know, or God can do it on his own. Just go, no, it ain't going to happen. And, uh, and change things. Um, angels do not know the future. They don't dwell in, any, in eternity. And I know that uh, a lot of people have taught this. I've taught this in the past too, that it's like when you're talking about heaven, heaven is all about et- eternity and it's the eternal state and therefore there is no time and, and, uh, and that kind of thing. But when you go through the Bible and you look at um, what's happening in Scripture, for example, there's a passage in Revelation chapter 6 that talks about the martyrs under the altar. And they say, how long, O Lord, until you judge those on the earth? And they're waiting for judgment. And the key there is they're waiting. And they're saying, how long? And so obviously you have a situation where events are following events. And admittedly, God can... Put, the, put that language in there so that we can have some kind of time, you know, situation where we can, where we can follow it because we don't understand timelessness. But um, I'm telling you, as you go through the, through the book of Revelation, events follow events. And, and so even when you get into the eternal state in the sense that um, God makes a new heaven and a new earth, the old earth has to pass away. God's got to destroy it. And then there's a new earth and a new heaven. And so you have a new creation there. And then in the new creation, Jerusalem comes down to a new Jerusalem comes down. And you see, again, events are following events. Uh, when you get to the end of the book of Revelation, it talks about uh, a, a, a river that comes out from the city of God. And on the side of the river are 12 different kinds of trees and they bear 12 different manner of fruit, one for each month. And so now you have years and months, uh, again, in, in the book of Revelation. And that is uh, what we would call the eternal state in the sense that we've got the new heaven and new earth. That's where we're spending eternity. And so um, it looks like uh, in the Bible, heaven is subject to time. And you've got to remember that God's not subject to time. But uh, when God made the creation, he made the creation subject to time. And I'm not even saying that heaven has the same time that we have. I don't know that. You know, the time changes uh, depending on how fast you're going or whether or not you're, you're in a gravity well. And so time changes. And so that, that can be different. Here's another thing that um, in the old, uh, this is the thing that finally convinced me on this whole issue. In the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, um, and 
you know, I'm I'm always just referring to that. Let me let me get the exact passage. Let's see. It's in Daniel um, chapter. Daniel chapter 10. And in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel is fasting for three full weeks. So 21 days, right? And an angel appears to him and tells him that from the beginning of the time that Daniel began to fast, 21 days prior, he was sent as a messenger that was going to answer Daniel's uh, prayer, uh, answer his questions, basically. <clears throat> and um, he was delayed by somebody called the Prince of Persia. And he, um, he fought with the Prince of the Kingdom of Persia for 21 days. And it was after 21 days that Michael, the archangel, was sent to help him out. And, you know, obviously from that, you could tell that the Prince of Persia is a satanic entity. He's a, he's a demon. He's a fallen angel that's in charge of, uh, the, that is connected with the kingdom of Persia. Um, and what that's all about is if you want to be influential as a demon, um, you need to be where the influencers, influences are. Um, and the influences at this time were out of Persia. And so influences at our time are out of D.C. and Olympia. And so this is why we're to, we're to pray for our government officials because uh, Satan jumps in in those kinds of areas. In any case, the angel comes to Daniel after 21 days and says, I was delayed. Well, if you can, if you can step in and out of time, there is no delay. And so I step into time. The prince of Persia hassles me for 21 days. Michael comes in and, uh, and uh, ends the fight. All I got to do is step out of time again and step back in where Daniel's at. And there's no delay. And it's an indication that angels are subject to time. And so uh, all of that to say, what were we talking? I forgot the, the question. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so can evil predict the future? Okay. That's what you're talking about. Okay. So Satan cannot predict the future um, because he's subject to time. That's why there are false satanic prophecies. That's when, when uh, you know, when, a, when you, you get a prophecy from... Uh, a fortune teller or whoever who is actually in, in contact with the occult um, and those things don't come true, it's because God didn't allow it to come true. And again, that's not a prediction of the future. That's a prediction of Satan's intent to do something. And so you got a kid who's both playing with a Ouija board and um, uh, in the context of that, you, you've got... Uh, occultic things going on, you know, I'm, I'm just assuming uh, that actual supernatural things were taking place. You got a demon telling the kid, I'm going to kill you and this is good how I'm going to kill you. Well, that's only subject to if God allows that. And so uh, in the book of Mark, uh, one of the things that Jesus said is that, that these signs will follow believers and he talks about tongues and then he talks about the fact that they'll be able to take up deadly serpents and it won't harm them and they'll be able to drink poison, and that won't harm them. And it's the idea that God protects his people. Psalm 91 is all about God protecting his people. And so if I had a kid that um, had that said to him, I'd say, buddy, you know, that's just Satan trying to scare you, and we're going to ask for God's protection. And Satan can't touch you uh, if, if God doesn't want him to. And uh, I, I would take him to... Uh, passage, uh, passages that speak to that. Psalm 91 is a great one. As far as uh, just occultic stuff, here's a great passage on staying away from this stuff. It says, this is in uh, Isaiah 8, verse 19. It says, When they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. They will pass through it hard pressed and hungry, and it shall happen when they are hungry that they will, will be enraged and curse their king and their God and look upward. Then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they will be driven into darkness. 
And that is a passage warning against going to prognosticators and mediums. What was those verses? Did that, that's uh, Isaiah 8, 19 through 22. Isaiah 8, 19 through 22. And so uh, the reason that people um, seek after uh, mediums is so that they can get in contact with the spirit world. Uh, many times uh, they, uh, and when they're going to wizards, uh, wizards are diviners uh, in the sense that they, uh, they're fortune tellers. They're, they're trying to foretell the future. And um, what God says is you don't go there because um, uh, what's going to, you know, if they're not speaking according to what the word of God has to say, it's because there's no light in them. And so instead we go to God. God is the only one who can tell the future. And then it goes on and talks about a curse that's going to take place on people who do go to wizards and prognosticators and mediums and, and that kind of thing. And, and it says they'll, they'll see trouble and darkness, gloom and anguish, and they'll, they'll be driven into darkness. <clears throat> and if you've ever known somebody that, that's gotten full-blown into the occult, that's, that's their end. That's, that's what takes place. And it, it can be, become a real awful thing. So we're constantly warned about getting involved with the occult. Yeah, so I have a personal story that goes with this. When I uh, used to be in corrections, there was a kid who committed a heinous murder. He was 16 years old. Just very quickly, when I was walking by his cell, he had the law of Philoma written on, on his cell wall. I got in conversation with him. Long story short, his story to me was he was playing, not a believer, just a kid messing around with the occult, wanting power and mm -hmm. seeing some of the stuff behind the occult. So he's playing at the Ouija board, and the Ouija board tells him and his friend that they're going to kill somebody. The next day is when that happened. Mm -hmm. And so the whole uh, um, culture we have with the occult, with uh, witch shows and zombie shows and all that stuff, there's this whole drive, and it's on front. You know, my friend sent me a picture of he's just checking out the supermarket, and there's a magazine titled Witches. Mm-hmm. And it's like mainstream, not in the back somewhere or in the occult section. It's yeah. like what witches are and how you can become one mm -hmm. at the supermarket. Yeah. So obviously the Bible warns against that. Obviously it's not this f manifestation of a force of evil like in Star Wars or something. There are demons behind these things. Exactly. Um, with that warning, can you explain, since it is coming up to be the Halloween season... We get a lot of questions, and you have a lot of people wanting to know, why do we do a harvest party? Because their comments can be, well, if we're not supposed to participate and do any of that stuff, and the kids are dressing up in those things, why do we have a harvest party? So since it's coming up on Tuesday, can you just talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, you know, the, the earth is the Lord's and all the fullness thereof. And so... When I, when I look at the whole issue of Halloween, Halloween is going to happen whether or not we're involved or not, right? And so, you know, kids are going to go out and do this kind of stuff. And, and uh, the Bible talks about the fact that we need to come out from among them. That's absolutely true. And we need to not participate uh, in, their, in their junk. Um, and so, you know, when, I, when I'm looking at the whole issue of Halloween... Uh, you can you can come at this with the attitude that I'm just going to withdraw, and uh, when the little kids come up to my door, and uh, not that they do that this much anymore, but that's because our culture's so twisted. But if they come up to my door and, and knock on the door and say trick or treat, I just hide in my, you know, I hide in my back room with my lights off, so I don't have to lock, you know, talk to the kids, little kids in Halloween costumes and. And, uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, the reason that we do a harvest party is because I'm not willing to let Satan have a day. He doesn't get to have a day. It's not his. The earth is the Lord's and all the fullness thereof. And so um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna retreat on you know, every October 31st. That I, don't, I don't think that's what God's called us to do. And so what we do is we do a replacement. And you know, um, we encourage the kids in our fellowship to come in biblical costumes or, uh, well, actually when we, uh, when we do do costumes uh, at our school, um, we want the kids to come in biblical costumes. And, and so we negate, you know, the whole witch and warlock and vampire and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. We did have one kid uh, <laughs> who was in junior high. And one time he came to 
uh, school, uh, and uh, again, we're a Christian school. Uh, he came to school um, dressed up as a skeleton. And uh, he got called on it by the teachers, and he said, you know, I'm, I'm the dry bones in Ezekiel 37. And so in Ezekiel 37, Genius. it talks about all these bones scattered and that the bones come together and they, they make a skeleton. And uh, uh, God says, these are, are the dry bones of, of Israel. And uh, Israel is going to come back together. And yeah, it was genius. It was, it's like, I, you know, if I was a principal, I probably would have let him wear it because it was so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was so great. My wife, on the other hand, said, nope, we're not going to do that. Uh, we're going to have parents get freaked out by it. So uh, let's not do that. Um, but A for effort, A for, <laughs> a for creativity on, on that whole thing. And so I thought that that was hilarious. There's a, there's a number of things that, that you could be, you could be John the Baptist head on a platter, you know, <laughs> you know, when you, when you, there's a lot of stories in the Bible that are, that are pretty interesting. In any case, um, what we do with the, with the kids is we want them to dress up in something, uh, that's not, uh, satanic that, you know, the Bible doesn't condemn, uh, dressing up in costumes. And so, uh, we let little kids come in costumes, and uh, we encourage parents to make sure that they're not the, the freaky ones. And um, so when kids come in freaky costumes, witches and, and goblins and, and, uh, and that kind of thing, um, we just don't allow them to come in because that's what we're about. No, we allow them to come in. That's how you know the non-Christian family. Exactly. Yeah. And so what we want to do is minister to them. So at our harvest party... Um, we have a bunch of games and they have biblical themes to them. And so one is, you know, taking bing bags and, and knocking the head off a of Goliath. And so I like that one a lot. <clears throat> and <laughs> so we have biblical themes, uh, to the games and then we pass out candy to the kids because, you know, even, even when, uh, even before, uh, I had kids and was involved, uh, was a pastor and did harvest parties. Uh, when when um, uh, Halloween came uh, came around and, and the kids came out trick or treating, I went and got the best candy possible and I got a bunch of tracks. And when the kids would come, I would give them a big old candy bar and a and a, and a gospel track, um, so that uh, uh, at least if they couldn't read, their parents could read them, and uh, uh, you know get the gospel out. And I just use it as a as a um, opportunity to share the gospel with people. And, uh, um, if I get to talk with, uh, with anybody, that's exactly what I would do at my door. And so that was a cool thing. And that's what we do here. And, and so, uh, we'll have bands playing and they'll be playing Christian music and we'll have people who are getting up, sharing their testimony, talking about having a relationship with Jesus. And we'll have 2000 people milling around in our, in our field out here. And they're all going to hear the gospel multiple times. And, and so, again, Satan doesn't get to have a day. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's where, I'm at, where I'm at with that. So that's why we do that. You use the word uh, retreat a couple times. And if, when you look at the tactics of the apostles, like uh, mm -hmm. Elimus the sorcerer, the, the witch of Endor, and all these people, they're not running away and going, bring the children and hide them from the evil. It's like they're not afraid of that stuff. Mm -hmm. They expose it for what it is. And then they use um, the Holy Spirit to witness to these people and show them the spiritual contrast. Yeah. You know, you, you, you have examples, and, and Matt just mentioned one. You have examples where Paul the Apostle is getting opposed by a, a Jewish sorcerer. And um, basically Paul goes, well, you want to walk in blindness? You're going to be blind. And bam, the guy, the guy went blind at that point. And then the governor that he was trying to influence ended up becoming a Christian. And so, you know, Paul didn't with, withdraw from this nonsense. He, he stepped forward and he took care of it. And so, you know, uh, I, I just got the same attitude towards any day that somebody calls satanic. I'm not, I'm not going to withdraw. 